Hello IB Biology students, this is Ms. Sheely with your next installment of your video notes. Uh, this section is for 5.1, which is Evidence for Evolution. This is the first section in the Evolution and Biodiversity chapter, which is chapter 5. Remember to take notes as you watch the video. Today's are going to be short and sweet, but also to jot down any questions you have so that we can address them before we start the lesson in class. All right, so the first thing we want to do is remember what the definition is of evolution. Evolution is, of course, the cumulative change in the heritable characteristics of a population. So the big thing is that it is cumulative changes, which means small changes upon small changes over and over and over again, so over many generations. A big misconception for students is that one organism can evolve and have changes in its heritable traits in one lifespan, but this is looking at entire population or species over many, many generations. So of course those heritable characteristics are our gene controlled factors, and then we're looking at a population, we are not looking at individuals. So here you have a picture of how the evolution of the eye took millions of years. We started with just a pigment spot. This was a photoreceptive layer. Uh, so the pigment cells and nerve cells just on the epithelial level or in the, within the epithelium. And then that pigment spot uh, evolved into a pigment cup. And so it has kind of a chalice look to it. And so it, it folded in, still though just the photoreceptive layer and the nerve fibers within the epithelial. But then over time, we have a simple optic cup. So that chalice uh, layer of the photoreceptive cells, the, the epithelial uh, layers started to come in together. And then the photoreceptors layer or the retina um, started to get a little further deep and then that cavity filled with water. Over time we got a basic eye with a primitive lens so we have the addition of a refractive lens as the epithelial layers uh, connect together. And then the um, nerve fibers have turned into optic nerves. And then, of course, what we have now, the complex eye. In this particular example, we're looking at the complex eye of an octopus. So you still have that refractive lens, but now you have layers of iris and cornea as well. And the vitreous body is not just water-filled, but it has other molecules in it as well. All right, so a big person, of course, if we're talking about evolution, we need to talk about Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin was born in 1809. Um, here's a picture of a young Darwin, and he went on his studies for on the Beagle, making notes and collecting samples from around the world uh, between 1831 and 1836, so just a five-year period. In 1854, he formulated the mechanism for population splitting into new species, and we'll be looking at that in this uh, unit. In 1857, he contacted Alfred Russell Wallace about his own ideas on species. So at this point, Alfred Russell Wallace was publishing his ideas, and Darwin was reading them, taking them into consideration with what he had found and what his theories were. And two years later, he published On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, which we just refer to commonly as the book On the Origin of Species. In 1863, so just four years later, um, a fossil was discovered of an Archaeopteryx, and in that same year, 1863, we have Herbert Spencer, which coined the term of survival of the fittest. And then we have this picture of the older Darwin, the more common picture that you'll see, um, known as a naturalist and, of course, the author of On the Origin of Species. All right, so let's talk about speciation and patterns of variation. So this is Darwin's um, image of speciation. So speciation, sometimes populations become separated. And when they're separated, of course, they're unable to breed with each other. So even though they are the same species, they are populations of the same species, something has separated them, and now they are unable to breed with each other. And we'll be looking at an example um, with some lizards in class. 
these populations start to evolve differently and they diverge in their characteristics more and more over time. These changes may be gradually over thousands of years or even longer. Remember, this is not within one organism's lifespan. These organisms become so different that they are now unable to interbreed, even if the two groups were to become within the same area. And so now we have to classify them as two different species. This will make a little bit more sense when we do the activity in class with the lizards. All right, so another thing we want to look um, to or look at is pentadactyl limbs as evidence of evolution. So remember our terminology from our introductory biology, homologous structures. Darwin noticed many similarities in the structures of different species. So there's parts of the body, such as the pentadactyl limb, which have been adapted for different functions. And the evidence of the common ancestry shows adaptive radiation. So what in the world is this talking about? Okay, so a pentadactyl limb is, um, a, is a limb, um, it's a layout of a five-fingered limb. So when we're looking here, it doesn't matter if you're looking at a forelimb or a hind limb, we have one bone that splits into two bones, that splits into many bones, that splits into five digits. And looking at the radiation here, you have that same structure in a bat, one bone, two bones, many bones, five digits. Do the same thing in the dolphin, one bone, two bones, many bones, digits. An anteater, a mole, a horse. So the horse, um, sometimes it's harder to see. You do have the one bone, you have the two bones, and then the many bones are actually stacked on top of each other. Um, and then the digits are down at the bottom, and uh, a pig and a monkey. And this is what we're talking about. We're talking about adaptive radiation. So we have um, differences. So your monkey's limb, pentadactyl limb, is different from the bat's because the bat needs to be able to fly, so those bones are much more hollow and lightweight, and then we're spread out so that the skin surface of the bat's wings can um, help it with flying. Whereas a monkey is more for grasping, so his digits are going to be stronger and more compact. So that's adaptive radiation. It's radiation from the original structure, one bone, two bones, many bones, digits, into the adaptations that those organisms have for um, living. And you can see that over time here as well. All right, so another uh, support for, ev for evolution is the selective breeding of domesticated animals. So Darwin put forth this idea that humans had been selecting desirable traits in domesticated animals for centuries. And this was actually true. This was the process of artificial selection. And it's the foundation of selective breeding in both animals and plants. When a farmer notices a favorable trait, we're noticing that the corn is hardier or it's taller or we're getting more more um, bean pods on a plant, that's a favorable trait. And that individual, that uh, food source, will be allowed to reproduce. And this is selection for a trait. But when an individual, be that um, an animal or a plant, displays a negative characteristic, then the farmer or whoever it is is not going to allow that organism to mate. And this is selection against. So when some characteristics are selected for or against, other characteristics could also be affected. So this actually can give rise to further variation in the species. So that's something that we're not necessarily aware of when we first started to select for particular traits. All right, uh, another example of uh, support for ev evolution, excuse me, is the fossil record. So as layers of particularly sedimentary rock are put down, the inorganic components of plants, animals, and prokaryotes can be preserved. So simply put, the deeper they are, the older they are. So if you have a fossil here in this first dark brown layer, that's going to be a much younger fossil than, say, down in this yellow layer. There are some really good um, sources, which we may get to in class, but we may not, but you may want to check out. This one here is ev fossil evidence from PBS. 
You can see here these fossils show a transition over time that echoes the development of species through the theory of evolution. So here you've got different layers of similar looking species, but with slight changes each time. So you go from just a pentagon shape to a pentagon stage state shape, excuse me, with a star, then with some pointies um, coming off of it, and then with a more complex structure to those appendages. Some fossils, such as the famous Archaeopteryx, um, it represent a transition species, and we'll be looking at a transition species in class um, called Tiktaalik, and uh, you'll be able to understand that a little bit more. But transition species are really good examples, fossils, to show how there was change from one type of species to another. And in this case, we have the Archaeopteryx to a common bird. All right, one of the last things we're going to talk about in this section is the idea of melanism as an example of evolution. Melanism, when we're talking about that, the go-to example is the peppered moth. And um, that looking at the peppered moth mel melanism is actually evolution in action. So we have this moth called the peppered moth, and here is a picture of it here. It's a natural type. It's a, a white type, and that's called typica. And it was common before the Industrial Revolution. And so the selection pressure, what's going to determine or show the evolution is the predation of these moths by birds. And how we were able to see this is there was an environmental change. So before the Industrial Revolution, we had lots and lots and lots of the white phenotype. And they blended into trees like the birch trees. So this is really seen um, heavily in England where birch trees are common. And after the Industrial Revolution, we had a lot, or during the Industrial Revolution, I should say, we had a lot of sooty pollution from factories. So what happens to sooty pollution from factories? Well, it coats trees. And when the soot coated the trees, the white type that used to be camouflaged against the white lichen on trees such as birch trees are now not blending in. They're not camouflaged. So the typica would stand out against the soot-covered trees. Well, what happens when a moth stands out against soot-covered trees? The birds are able to prey on them, and their population declines due to that predation. Well, there was an exception. There was a mutation that caused some of the pepper moths to have a black phenotype. And the black phenotype before the Industrial Revolution stood out. It was not camouflaged against those lichen on the trees. And so the black phenotype was highly selected against due to the predation by the birds. But then once the soot came onto the trees, then the white phenotype stood out and the black phenotype was actually able to blend in. So what happened was the black phenotype became camouflaged by the soot and the population of the black increased. Well, over time we've had clean air policies and the clean air policies have actually been, we've been able to see the reversal of this evolution and action of the change in the peppered moth melanism. So before the Industrial Revolution, we had lots and lots of white phenotype peppered moths and very few black phenotype. During the Industrial Revolution, because of the soot pollution from the factories, we saw a decrease in the white phenotype and we saw an increase in the black phenotype. With the clean air policies and the cleaning of uh, the control of the pollution, we saw another change back to a decrease of the black phenotype and an increase of the white phenotype back to the way that it was before the Industrial Revolution.